my name is Stephanie Vadalero. Um, as Mary Beth mentioned, I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communications for the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. I'm excited to be here today with Rob Southwick and his staff to talk more about fishing participation trends. A uh, really quick background for what I do for RBFF. Uh, we run what we consider to be the industry's campaign to increase participation in fishing. We are bringing those newcomers into the sport who are one day going to become customers of your business, part of your clubs, etc. So um, the Take Me Fishing campaign is how we do that. If you've heard of takemefishing.org, we drive people there for how to and where to information and link them up with their state agencies. Uh, but we also do extensive research to understand what's motivating that newcomer and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Hello, I'm Rob Southwick, um, company of Southwick Associates. We've been working in the sport fishing industry for now about 33 years. Uh, we focus exclusively on outdoor recreation, the economics of why people go in the outdoors, how much money they spend, what are the trends in sales, how can you secure more customers where they want in the way of new products. Um, so I'm joined here today by Ben Scuderi. He's our senior analyst and also our lead economist at Southwick Associates. And we have a lot of detailed insights trying to explain what is going on in the market. It's been a crazy year since last time we talked to you last year. So going through this here, we're going to start first by um, going through the participation trends. So that's the consumer side, what's happening with the consumer. And then we'll talk about the business side, what's going on within the trade. What does the consumer trends mean to us as businesses? And then we'll go into some 2022 predictions. What do you think is going to happen from here? And then at the end, we're going to share with you the resources that we're using here today. So you, at the end, we have a couple slides you can take pictures of so you can access these information resources when you go back to the office. So to start off with the participation trends, I'm going to turn it back to Stephanie. Rock and roll. Thank you very much. So as I mentioned, um, the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation does a lot of research to inform our campaigns. We want to make sure what we put out in the market is going to resonate with people and really motivate them to go uh, fishing and boating. So when you look at participation as a whole, we just released this week our special report on fishing, uh, which really digs into all the demographics and participation trends. You can see that we definitely had some softening from our uh, crazy wild ride in 2020 where five million new people went fishing for the first time. Uh, we definitely had some softening. We lost about, probably about half of what we brought in over the pandemic. Not totally a surprise, but we really wanna keep those other 2.5 million anglers that came in new. And you can see the positive news is you look at that yellow line, we're on an upward trend overall over the last several years. We're, we're still ahead of where we were pre-pandemic. Fishing license sales, uh, kind of a similar story, up, down, up, down, but overall that trend is going up. Now these are the US Fish and Wildlife Service certified uh, license sales, so they only goes through 2020 here. You can see that kind of start to peak up during 2020. Rob has a different look at these numbers. He's gonna dig into a little bit deeper uh, in his section. So one of the things we've uh, researched uh, a ton is you know who has the propensity to go fishing to pick up fishing uh, we know that if you did it at a young age 80 percent 86 percent of today's participants fished as a child that is the strongest indicator of adult participation but there's also groups um, that show tremendous potential for growth in the long term uh, and those that we track and and focus in our campaigns are youth females, and Hispanics. And in almost all cases, almost all demographics of participation this year, we saw a similar story, which was numbers are down a little bit from 2020, but they're still up over 2019. So we still have a really healthy base. Now here comes the challenge. Who's familiar with the leaky bucket? Have you seen that before? We've been dealing with the leaky bucket for quite some time. Now what this represents is in 2020, we had a total participant base of 55, almost 55 million anglers. In 2021, we had 11.6 new and returning anglers. However, we lost 14 million. They're leaking out of the bottom of the bucket. So as much as we're working to bring new people into the sport, it's not always sticking. 
And it's a problem that has been getting worse over the last several years. We used to average out, you can see from this grid, between four and five million a year would lapse out of the sport. Over the last several years, we've seen nine, 9.2, 8.7, 14 million. Not good. We have a negative trend here, and it's something that we're going to be tackling in our campaigns, moving forward and sharing with the industry what we learn along the way. So who are those lost participants? Um, this is a very high level look at this, and I want you to know there are some infographics on the table over here when you leave. If you want to take one or scan the QR code on it, it'll give you access to the full report, which has a whole lot more detail in it. But at a high level, uh, the lost participants are both male and female, about even. Uh, the majority of them live in the South Atlantic area. They are, the majority of our lost participants in 2021 were age 55 or older, and that's really been growing in the last several years. Those are our baby boomers. They're aging out of the sport. And that's why we exist to bring those new participants into the sport. And also 74% of the lost participants in 2021 were Caucasian. I'm gonna turn it over to Rob now to talk about some fishing licenses. Thank you, appreciate that. So there are a number of information resources that we use to track trends in the industry. The information from the RBFF, highly recommend you do get that special report she mentioned and the flyer over there. Um, there's others that we'll, again, we'll share with you at the end, but one of the long-term in indicators we use are license sales. A lot of people have to buy a license. And so we do collect license information directly from state fish and wildlife agencies. Not all state fish and wildlife agencies, but for those that do report, about half of them, it gives us very precise, detailed information about license buyers. And here's what we've seen in the last two years. So in, in 2021, as you saw in the graph that Stephanie showed, participation was down. It's down about 6%. And of course, anytime you see a negative number, that's something that we get a little concerned about. But in this case, it's really important to understand and remember that 2020 peak was really, really unusual. So of course, participation is gonna drop a little bit. In fact, um, there's a study we're just wrapping up right now. We went back and we talked to a lot of these anglers who had lapsed out as a license buyer. So we could identify in the license data who was a first time license buyer in 2020. We call them the surge anglers. And we talked to them and a lot of them are saying they're not gonna come back. They went fishing because their favorite activities were not as available. As the analogy I shared this morning by Glenn at the breakfast is that you know, all the professional sporting events, they're closed down in 2020. Now people are going back to those. So our competition is coming back. Our goal is to retain, as mentioned, we have to retain as many of these anglers as we can. So license sales are down, but still they're way up compared to 2019. Um, we're in a good spot, but the declines are, are varying. As mentioned, the rate of women dropping out as our anglers is twice that of males. And so we had a big spike in female participation. They came in at rates two times greater in 2020 than men. And they checked us out and they left. They didn't find those benefits they're looking for with their free time. They still have free time. There's other things they'd rather do with their free time that are more rewarding. So we want to learn more about that and stay engaged with the RBFF programs. They're looking at that very closely. The first time license buyers. So we know we had that big surge in 2020 and a lot of it was, is, is many different reasons. People wanted to get outdoors, they want to spend time with their family, things you've heard about in the past. You know, they're tired of being cooped up and fishing was perfect. We saw a huge spike in, in kids going fishing. Everybody anecdotally has seen that too. Um, but the rate of first timers coming into fishing this past year in 2021 was way down compared to 2020, but still way up compared to the year before. Um, I think it's the next point right there. So what's intriguing is in 2021, we saw fishing easing back, people going back to normal, but we had anglers coming in at rates much higher than they did in 2019. So either our new anglers out there are taking their friends out there, they're recruiting for us, and we know that's number one way people get into fishing when they're invited to go, hence take me fishing. That's still, I think that's probably what was driving most of it. But some of the cultural things, people talking about fishing, the awareness of it are still there. So those mechanisms are driving people to fishing are still benefiting us at rates greater than pre-COVID. 
Let's see, but at the same time, too, we're also in the same decline. Women are not coming in at rates um, as fast as they were in the past. This is a critical market we need to maintain, especially for young families, because usually when you have the female, um, you know, the blessing of, the, of going fishing, it happens. That, that is critical. I'm not going to talk, talk any further about that. You're doing a lot of research in that area. They're the expert over there. We can go on forever on that important topic. Um, but one, one thing that's really intriguing in the license sales data, um, Something's going on with this Gen Y, or millennial age group. And it's intriguing, because about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, we saw declines in youth fishing. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a lot of great data that we, we look at, and they're declining. But that same group is now coming into fishing at rates much, much greater than any other age group. In fact, two and a half times more than any other age group. In fact, if you really want to play with the data, if we, did not, if we looked at the growth in fishing, for the last 10 years, if we took out that Gen Y group, we, have, we would be flat. Our growth is primarily coming from this segment. Now, there's a lot of speculation. Or is it they, they're finally getting, going outdoors. But this, that was a generation that really had more electronic choices and other things. And now they're realizing, that, hey, they can go outdoors. They can do certain things. Now, they're driving the firearm sales at the areas, too. So something's going on, but we don't know exactly what it is yet. And at ASA, we'll be looking at that. The plan is to explore into that further next year because there's some kind of marketing element that we can use in there to help, recreate, to help recruit more customers to our retail stores, to our industry. So we'll be hoping to share more insights there. But keep your eye on your customers when they walk into the store. Are they fit in that age generation, mid-30s? Do they have kids? They may not be an experienced angler. Treat them like a new angler. Give them attention. They're the ones that are driving our growth right now. Um, what's going on so far this year? Talking to about 20 states, looking at their data, license sales are still going down. So it looks like end of this year, we might be back to 2019 levels. We're still not retaining all of them. Most of the license sales have already occurred now for this year. Most license sales happen between March and June of every year. So we're, we're going down a little bit again, but we're still at levels higher than 2019. Um, so we, we got to keep them engaged, do what we can here. I'm going to turn it over at this point to Ben Scuderi. Um, he is our expert on the tackle sales and the trends, the business side, and have him talk about what's going on in the, the dollar side of our business. Great. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, yeah, like he said, I'm here to talk about tackle sales. And in order to do that, um, the first thing I want to do is go back to 2020, take a look at what happened in 2020. Uh, Probably not a surprise to anybody, but fishing tackle sales were up huge in 2020. Uh, up 55%, we estimate, from 2019 levels. Uh, of course, this wasn't uh, consistent across the industry. Uh, independent tackle retailers told the ASA that their sac tackle sales were up around 30%. So a lot of these increases came from larger retailers, bigger box stores. A lot of the new anglers who went fishing during the pandemic, they didn't necessarily shop at their independent uh, tackle retailer, they, they visited Amazon, they visited these online retailers that they might be more comfortable uh, visiting. Um, additionally, uh, close to 90% of retailers told the ASA that they had issues with inventory during the pandemic. Um, so imagine that 55% increase could have been even bigger if there weren't these supply chain issues that a lot of businesses struggled during the pandemic. Um, additionally, uh, terminal tackle and accessories, these were two of the categories that grew the most. What this tells us is a lot of these increases in fishing participation and spending were by our regular anglers. These are people who were already fishing before the pandemic. Um, the, those people had more time on their hands, they went fishing more, and they, they bought more product as a result. Um, in 2020, the size of the industry reached $9.7 billion, which was a, a, a record at the time, and it's kind of a staggering number. Um, 2021, uh, we continued to see uh, really excellent growth in sport fishing. In fact, it exceeded $10 billion uh, for the first time. Uh, the NPD group, which shares with us uh, sales from major fishing tackle retailers, they estimated that their sales were up on average about 15%. Uh, at the same time, units actually slightly declined during 2021, and that tells us that the average price of a lot of these fishing products increased during 2021. Uh, additionally, independent retailers told the ASA that their sales were up 17% in 2021. So unlike 2020, where we saw maybe the larger big box stores leading the independent retailers, in 2021, the growth was pretty even across the industry. 
looking further into the reasons uh, why 2021 stayed so strong, independent retailers told the ASA that a lot of it was due to greater interest in fishing in their areas, uh, availability of new products. And in a lot of cases, these are products that retailers weren't able to get in their stores in 2020. And the supply chain issues resolving, they were able to get more products in their stores. Additionally, there was population growth in a lot of the areas that these retailers are located. And a lot of them tried new marketing techniques and business practices with a lot of success. If anyone is interested in some of these new marketing techniques, I highly encourage that you visit the RBFF's website. They have a lot of resources uh, for retailers in terms of marketing strategies. Uh, 2021 still saw inventory issues, though. Uh, again, more than 80% of retailers told the ASA that they struggled with supply chain during 2021. So that brings us up to 2022. Uh, so what's going on this year? Well, so far, um, one of the major data sources that we use to track the industry is uh, federal excise taxes. As a lot of you know, manufacturers have to pay an excise tax on any fishing equipment they produce. Um, so far this year, we've seen a 16.3% increase in excise tax receipts. This tells us that there is a lot of product being manufactured and shipped. Um, However, on the other end, MPD Group tells us that so far this year, uh, their major retailers are reporting about a 14% decrease in sales. Um, and again, that they had seen increases in 2021. That's starting to come back down to earth. Uh, additionally, unit sales are down even further. Um, this kind of further shows that those price increases we saw in 2021 have continued into 2022. We're actually seeing even larger price increases over the 2021 prices. So average price seems to be something uh, that has gone up and that is continuing into 2022 and into the foreseeable future. And for some more predictions, I'm gonna pass it back over to Rob. Thank you, thank you, Ben, I appreciate it. Um, so what does all this mean? Where are we going? That's always the biggest question. Um, I'm gonna to try to pull together all these trends and let you know, and actually two different predictions. The first, first I want to talk about what may happen in the way of participation, because that's what impacts retailers. People fishing means they're going to the store to buy a product. But as Ben has just shown, there's been a split in direction so far this year between the retail consumer side and the wholesale manufacturer side. So I'm going to give a second prediction for what's happening to the manufacturing side of the business. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty out there right now, and what's driving a lot right now is this really, really low unemployment rate. I mean, we're at record lows, and we've seen basically five out of the last six recessions going back 30 years, when unemployment climbs, fishing participation goes up. So recessions are typically very good for fishing participation and sales, especially more the lower price, mid price range. So now we're talking about a possible recession coming up, coming up, but what's really unusual is that unemployment is still very, very strong. So that's one thing that's kind of a, a, a dichotomy in what's happening out there. But as long as unemployment remains low, we're gonna see this downward participation rate in fishing. That's what drove a lot of the drop last year, because our core market tends to be the trades, home building, um, repair, and they're working as much as they can. They're working weekends, they're working nights, they don't have the time to go fishing. So that's a headwind we have right now. Fuel prices, especially in marine areas, you know, when you have to pay $7 for marine fuel and you're gonna run two hours each way to go fishing, a lot of people just don't go as often. So that's gonna impact participation going forward, as long as our fuel prices remain high. This downward trend recently in prices, we hope that keeps happening. Um, we also have a, a sentiment index that we operate at Southwick Associates. We talk to anglers. Now, right now, what's your plans on purchasing three months down the road compared to three months ago and compared to a year ago? And since the peak in 2020, the sentiment is still going down. People are not planning on buying that much fish and tackle right now as they did back in 2020 when we won the lottery. So again, don't look at as depressing news because 2020 is a phenomenal year. But this tells us is that there's still slight headwind when it comes to consumers wanting to buy fishing tackle. Um, so the prediction pulling all this together, we think that participation is going to continue to drop. We think it's going to match 2019. Another 5% down will put us at 2019 levels. But again, 2019 was a great year. The slide that Stephanie showed you, 2019 was an all-time high before we hit COVID. 
And that was a good year. I remember the trade show. That was a good year. So let's not get so caught up in what happened last year. Again, you won the lottery the year before. Don't compare your income the next year to the year you won the lottery. So it's still, it's still a strong thing out there. Um, we think overall sales will, will trend, of course, with participation, but just don't forget we're still at a, much, a really high place compared to years in the past. But it won't be rosy everywhere. Um, new boat sales we know are already going down. Infolink, the, the index they release on boat registrations is going down. And of course, with that, um, offshore tackle sales and higher price tackle sales, because our consumers are telling us the index that they are holding back on big purchases being uncertain about inflation, interest rates, and where, where the economy is going. So long as they keep fishing, consumable items are gonna sell, mid-price, lower price will keep selling. Some of the higher price points in marine will be the sector to be a little cautious about. And also, if you sell, um, serve traveling anglers, are doing great. Now, outfitters are booked a couple years out in advance a lot of places, so travel gear, travel rods, booking trips, that's a great place to be right now. Um, the second prediction about the manufacturing wholesale side of the business, so it's a little bit different. As Ben had mentioned, we do have some supply chain issues out there. There's still problems getting the containers out of China, and it's still happening. But we do know from the surveys that very few anglers are telling us they're canceling trips or had to reduce their fishing participation. Anglers are finding ways, they're finding substitute products, different fishing methods. They're still going fishing. Only about 5% of anglers are saying they had to cut back on the fishing because they couldn't find the equipment that they needed. So that, that's a positive thing, at least. Um, the increasing inflation interest rates, if you're a manufacturer, of course, you're financing your pr production, um, you're shipping now, receiving the funds down the road. So that's, that's a concern for profitability. And then as mentioned, with the data from the NPD group, which is vital to a lot of our long-term um, projections here, is showing that the larger retailer sales are down while we know wholesale shipments increased in the first half of this year. So that means we have probably has some bigger headwinds at the manufacturing wholesale level. So retailers are gonna be sitting on a little bit more inventory than typically they might. So they're gonna cut their orders back more than you might see a, a consumer action. Um, and that's gonna cause a slowdown. So uh, maybe a 10% drop at orders at the manufacturing wholesale level. The only way I think that could be overcome is if there's an increase in unemployment. Again, if a recession does come through, and it looks like, you know, I'm an economist by training, so has Ben, and we're thinking that there, there may be a recession, but it's gonna be minor, because there's so much cash out there still from the COVID. There's a lot of money out there people wanna spend. So it would take a big increase in the unemployment rate to get more people out there fishing. And right now, people have money to spend, they're gonna keep working. I don't know if that's gonna quite happen. Um, but you'll see some squeeze on pressures, uh, pressures on your profits too, because of the interest rates. Um, over with that, some more prediction. So not, not to be Mr. Cheery, Mr. Rosy here, but that's what we see in the numbers. I want to turn over to Stephanie to talk about the general populace. General, the general consumer. Thank you, Rob. He's got all the uh, dollars and cents information. Happy, happy. Everybody. And I like the uh, national trends. Um, so actually, some of this actually aligns pretty nicely with what you just went through. Uh, it's just looking at it through a different lens. Uh, we look to Harris Poll and other sources like that to find out what's going on with the consumer. What are they thinking? Uh, what are the opportunities that we could tap into to increase participation? And I just want to pull out three things here. Uh, everyone's worried about their finances right now, as Rob was just talking. Um, inflation, a potential recession. And we do know that in times like this, uh, history tells us that fishing participation usually goes up in these times. Now, is that linked to unemployment? I guess we'll find out. But potentially, that could be a good thing for fishing. Food prices. Americans are really concerned about their food prices. And they're having a hard time when they go to the grocery store. This is like a number one concern for American families. You know, why not take advantage of this time to talk about fishing being an inexpensive way to put a meal on the table? I know a lot of us here are focused on the sport of fishing, but there's also the sport of eating, which I quite enjoy. <laughs> um, mental health. I mean, God, what, what hasn't happened to stress us out in the last two years? You know, we've got a global pandemic, a financial crisis, politics, you name it. Uh, we know. Several research studies point to the fact that fishing and boating can be the remedy to mental health. There are so many great benefits of being out on the water, uh, connecting with friends and families, and making these lasting memories, things that make you feel good about yourself and disconnect from our crazy, hectic world.
the study I mentioned earlier, the special report on fishing, uh, we do actually poll people on whether or not they intend to go fishing. And the good news is, I mean, people don't always live up to their word, but 99% said they plan to go fishing um, in the following year. And that was actually slightly up from 2020. So those who are out there are enjoying it and they plan to do it more. 32% uh, plan more than 20 outings. That's up from 2020 and 40% are planning eight to 20 outings. So RBFF doesn't sell anything. We're a nonprofit. And you know, once we get consumers to come in and get interested about fishing and boating, we're sending them to you. We're sending them to the states to get their licenses and to you all to get their tackle. Um, but one of our main indicators for how things are going is our website. All of our advertising, marketing, PR, social media drives to takemefishing.org. That's where we get, we teach folks how to fish and we teach them where to go. And so a positive indicator that we're seeing is when you look at the last few years, um, we are on par with our traffic. Now what's incredible is you look at, for the first few months of 2020, our fiscal year, 2022, we've had about 10 million visits to our digital properties. That's on par with last year, uh, slightly above 2020, and way above 2019, where we saw a total of 18 million visits in the entire year. Last year, we hit 61. So there's an interest out there. People are engaging with the content. There's a real opportunity, I think, to get out in front of them with good content about how to, where to, and to remind them how fun fishing and boating can be. In terms of resources that we have to help the industry, um, RBFF does a lot of research. And again, uh, pick up or scan one of these infographics on your way out. That'll lead you to our research section. Uh, but if you go to our website, let me click again. Um, we have a lot of different resources there. Marketing materials, toolkits, photo libraries, um, what else? Website plugins, all kinds of things I can't even remember right now. Uh, we're here to help you do a better job. So take advantage of these resources and always feel free to give us feedback if there's something not there that you really, really need. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I also wanted to point out a bunch of available resources through the ASA. Um, through your, if you are an ASA member, uh, the ASA each year uh, distributes a market size report. Um, it's free to ASA members. Uh, we create that each year. Uh, if you're not an ASA member, um, please feel free to contact uh, Nancy Bacon in the back or myself or Rob, and we're happy to get you that report. If you are an ASA member, please contact Rob Russell, and he'll make sure that you get uh, that report, the market size report. Our 2021 market size report uh, was just recently finalized, so that is available for distribution. Uh, additionally, uh, there's a couple different sources for license sales trends. As Rob has mentioned, um, directly through the ASA's website, uh, we have a license sales dashboard. Um, please visit the ASA's website uh, and look for the data dashboard link. You'll see uh, there's several states represented there. You can see their fishing license sales uh, and trends over the years. So you can uh, take an in-depth look at participation across different demographic groups as well. Um, additionally, we have an angler personas report where we've done a consumer segmentation uh, looking at the reasons why people go fishing. Uh, this is a really valuable resource uh, for retailers, um, so I highly encourage you to take a look at that report. Uh, additionally, we've done economic impact reports for the ASA. Um, we've broken out economic impacts at the state level as well as the congressional district level. That is also available on ASA's website. Um, we've also, we do an independent retailer report each year, uh, also available through ASA, and there's a lot of additional research that we do for the ASA available to you guys. In addition to ASA resources, all of those reports are available online free, um, except for the market size report, and it only goes to ASA members. But at Southwick Associates, we do a lot of research on behalf of industry. We work with a lot of companies to help them understand the market size. Uh, again, Nancy Bacon in back of the room, white shirt. You can, you can talk to her if you want any of this information. Um, information about media habits of anglers, what they're buying, the top brands, where they're shopping, type of retail outlets. Uh, we, but most of our work we do for the industry is custom research, helping individual companies understand what 
customers want from their specific products, how they compare to their competitors, um, help uh, test new products before they go to market, and more. Um, another important data source that's just come available lately is the NPD group. As you've mentioned, you've seen how we use it. It is the most timely information for the larger retailers especially. It is the most timely information and thorough in that sector because it's POS data. Um, Julia, uh, she's in the back there, raise your hand. Julia Day, um, her contact information, you can take a picture of it on the screen if you're interested in the NPD's um, POS information they have on the trade. Um, excellent information, again, we use it to help track overall trends in, in the industry. So to wrap it up here, I say on behalf of Stephanie and Ben, um, thank you very much. We're gonna stick around for a few questions, but we really appreciate you being here. Any final comments, anything? No. All right, well, we have for questions. <laughs> Everybody, thank you very much, we appreciate it. So we're gonna take some questions. We appreciate if you um, speak into the microphone because we're recording this session. Is there any questions from the audience? Anything at all for our speakers? We've got one back here. Hi, all. I'm Grace Petito Williamson, and I'm not gonna say who I'm with because it's not really about this question, but I love the idea that be, um, fishing for food for sustenance is part of the conversation and I'm wondering and you might not be able to answer this but how can we capture that because I know in maybe in California I know South Carolina has some programs that work with it they're not always getting fishing licenses they're getting food on the table and so that's part of the conversation like how does the industry try to evolve to meet those needs I'm just glad that's part of the conversation um, so thank you yeah, I think it's something we don't talk about very much here at ICAST because we are largely focused on the sport, but um, I'm sure everyone in this room has eaten some fish, maybe even this week. Um, and there are certainly opportunities where you can, you know, put dinner on the table for your family. Um, not from every fishery, and you have to know that. But um, yeah, I think there's definitely an opportunity there. And we produce some how to cook fish recipes that do really well in our social channels. People like engaging that with that content. They like knowing that they can do this fun thing all day and then have that reward at the end. Adding to that, it's, it's a tricky issue. When I started back late 80s, the ethos was let them go, catch and release. And we've been really strong about that and we succeeded. Look at the rebound in the redfish fishery in Florida and Snook where we, we went to that. But there are some fisheries that can certainly withstand harvest. And we should encourage that because we do know a lot of the entrants are fishing for food, not for economic reasons. You're better off you know, buying fish than fishing, but it's the mental aspects, it's the local vor movement, the satisfaction. For some it is economic, but that's a still a small group. So we have to be very careful. But I would stress on that, other research we've done about entry level participants, a lot of them hesitate or they don't go back to fishing because they're saying, I don't know what to do with the fish. I don't know how to handle it. I don't know how to take care of it. I don't know how to clean it. So at the retail level, when you're talking to the new angler, you're setting that person up to go out to catch fish. But are you helping that new angler and say what to do with it once they catch it? And remind them, they know, they're, they're just thinking about getting out the door. Remind them, okay, when you catch a fish, what are you gonna do next? Now here's a fillet knife, here's a do, here's a video, a YouTube resource, do what you can, because that's the person that's gonna go fishing again, because they're satisfied. So it's a business opportunity and it's necessary to retain them. Any other questions? Anything at all? One more. Quick question for Rob. Um, the outlook is the outlook, but <laughs> the past two years we've seen obviously in it enhanced spike in, in sales, specifically with manufacturing and uh, the need for product and sales. Um, you've been around in this industry for 30 plus years. Ha is there a similar market trend in a prior year that you could compare it to? Um, I know it's a, a lot of firsts in the last couple of years, but any comments on that? Um, no, there, there's no comparison. It's exactly that. We've never seen a recession where unemployment stayed at record low levels. So we're not officially in a recession yet, but if we do go into one, unemployment is really gonna have to move up to make a difference in, in, in participation. We, 
it just never happened before. So every, all the predictions I give you, you got to take with a grain of salt. And I do want to emphasize, I don't mean to be Mr. Negative. We, we are looking at some declines, but you're talking after that lot, big high, we're talking a little decline. We're still in a good spot, but there's a lot of uncertainties because we have no historical data to compare to this current unprecedented situation. Thank you for letting me clarify. All right, one last question from the audience. Anything else? All right, well, I'd love to thank our speakers. They did a phenomenal job. Let's give them a round of applause.